The biological approach assumes that mental disorders are the result of physical causes, such as faulty brain structure, abnormal brain functioning, and in some cases, genetic inheritance. When you're asked to evaluate something, you're required to judge its value. The biological approach has strengths and weaknesses that need to be analysed before any reasoned judgement can be made about how well it explains the causes of mental disorders. As the approach states that disorders are biological, someone with a diagnosis of a mental disorder cannot be blamed for their condition. They are simply ill. You can't control your genes or your brain chemistry, so individuals are blameless and, can, and their behaviour can be viewed sympathetically. This approach provided society with an explanation that made behaviour that had previously been seen as bizarre and frightening suddenly understandable. The shift from placing so-called lunatics in asylums to treating patients in hospital has been viewed by many as a positive. Another strength is that the approach has been widely supported by evidence. Family and twin studies have supported a role for genes. Studies have also shown that some disorders improve when treated with drugs that act on the levels or action of neurotransmitters. Brain scan studies have also revealed differences in the structure of the brain in some patients with some disorders. It's also worth pointing out that biological treatments such as drugs are popular despite the development of many psychological therapies. This suggests that the approach is viewed as credible among mental health professionals. There are weaknesses, however, with the idea of explaining mental disorders through biological processes. The idea that mental disorders are biological and physical is not accepted by everyone. A group called the Anti-Psychiatry Movement raised serious objections to the claim that the best way to approach mental disorders is to label those who cannot cope as ill and give the illness a name. Thomas Sars, a psychiatrist and social critic, also objected on these grounds, claiming that the approach stigmatises people by giving them a meaningless label such as depressed or schizophrenic. The labels could be considered to categorise and define people in an attempt to control them rather than to understand the behaviours and the meaning behind them. Another weakness is that the approach can be considered to be limited by its reductionism. Reductionism is when behaviour is explained in terms of its simplest, most basic elements. The focus on genes, brain structure and brain functioning ignores the influence of and interaction with psychological and environmental factors. This is particularly concerning as the evidence that supports the model does not suggest that biology is responsible for disorders on its own. For example, twin studies produce concordant rates around 50% at best, but a solely genetic cause should produce something closer to 100%. A model called the diathesis stress model fits the evidence much better proposing that your biology predisposes you to develop a disorder, but that this will only happen with particular environmental triggers, such as serious life events. The approach might provide an explanation of the symptoms of a disorder, but may not really tell us what causes the disorder in the first place. For example, the low levels of serotonin seen in depression might be a physical symptom and an effect of the depression, rather than the cause itself. Similarly, abnormalities in brain structure might be the effect of a disorder and not the cause. The next step before you're ready to evaluate is to revisit these strengths and weaknesses. Look for counter-criticisms and links between arguments. Assess the weight of some of these points in terms of how much of a positive or negative they really represent. Once you've done this, you're ready to have a go at making a reasoned judgement about how well the biological approach explains the causes of mental disorders.